The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 16039 in the name of Bruce Crawford on Scottish gigabit cities. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Would those members who wish to speak in the debate please press the request to speak buttons now and I'm out to learn stuff, Mr Crawford. Mr Crawford. And I'm always willing to teach you, President Officer. <laughs> President Officer, I'd like to thank sincerely my MSP colleagues who've supported my motion and enabling me to bring this debate to the Chamber. Can I also thank those who have stayed behind this evening to listen to the debate? One thing I, th I think I can safely say, President Officer, is having an inter internet connection is not what it used to be. Remember the early days of, of dial-up? Well, actually, it wasn't that long ago. Remember the falling out with our family members who simply wanted to talk on the, on the landline but couldn't do so because they couldn't use the internet and the landline at the same time? Well, gone is the age of the internet of steam and wood, with the average family home now much quieter and the internet much faster. We are now, in, now wirelessly connected, not just through our PCs accessing, accessing the internet, but also our televisions, our tablets, our games consoles. I can, I can imagine the presiding officer is on a games console every night. And even our lights, central heating and security systems. This is technology that's brought us together made shopping, booking a holiday, finding cooking recipes and DIY hints much faster and easier, at least for most of us, presiding officer, given the conversation that we had earlier. However, with increasing demand for the internet to power our lives, naturally the demand for faster and stronger connection has also grown. Presiding officer, you can imagine my delight, therefore, when City Fibre announced they would embark on a project that would deliver ultra-fast broadband to almost every household in the city of Stirling. The result being that Stirling has the potential to transform into a world-leading digital city as one of the first cities in the UK to benefit from City Fibre's Fibre to Premise programme. The ambition of the partnership between Stirling Council and City Fibre is to enable Stirling to become the first gigabyte city in the UK, and I like that. Gold standard, full fibre connectivity can help ensure that Stirling is at the forefront of digital innovation. It can provide the catalyst to build on the city, Stirling City region deal, energising the, the digital district plans. The applications and benefits of gigabit speed internet connectivity are almost endless. It will provide significant comparative advantage for the SME sector, as well as improved inward investment potential. The city's existing 24 kilometer full fiber network launched in 2017 to connect the city's schools, libraries, and community ven venues will expand citywide to reach nearly every home and business in Stirling. The first ho homes already have access to gigabyte speed broadband services of up to a thousand megabit per second. The first businesses will soon be able to enjoy, connect and enjoy the same advantages. That is what you call going at full speed. City Fibre's £2.5 billion project will also deliver this technology to the doors of people across 5 million premises in the UK. There will be more than £200 million investment into Scotland alone, with Edinburgh, Aberdeen and Stirling all set to benefit from one gigabit per second ultra-fast broadband speeds. Glasgow will also see investment expanding the network to serve public sector and business sites. And Inverness, Fort William, Thurzo and Wick will begin their full fibre journey under this programme with over 150 public sector sites to be connected. City, the Stirling City alone will see a £10 million investment from City Fibre. And when complete, the project will serve 18,000 Stirling properties will have the potential to connect to full fibre to premise broadband. Faster broadband also means smoother and faster ways to run modern day businesses. The infrastructure impact alone, it is estimated will result in a six million pound boost in the value of the local sterling economy, with a further eight million pound boost in the local sterling economy as a result of activity from new and emerging businesses in the area. But you know, Full fibre unlocks the potential also of modern healthcare technology. And I've seen for myself 
some of the new and innovative ways that patients could, for example, monitor their own blood pressure and send live updates to their GP. This is the future. Technologies such as this can be hugely beneficial in helping to diagnose, treat and support patients. President Officer, it's safe to say that I'm quite excited about this new infrastructure will unlock for my constituents as well as for people in various places across Scotland. Full fibre investment proje projects like City Fibres in Stirling is of course complemented by the Scottish Government's target of ensuring access to superfast broadband for each and every premise in Scotland. And despite telecoms being reserved to Westminster, the Scottish Government is building on the success of the £400 million Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband Programme. The Scottish Government will invest a further £600 million to ensure that Scotland is at the forefront of digital connectivity to reaching 100% of premises in Scotland. And based on the latest figures I have available, 89.4% of premises in the Stirling area can now access speeds of 30 megabits per second and above. In fact, an incredible 95% of Stirling properties in total have access to the fibre network, albeit not every property can access super fast broadband speeds yet. And BT Openreach's role should also be recognised for the substantial part they have played in this achievement. Yes, it's wholly understandable that private investment in this arena will find the more densely populated areas more attractive. That is why the, the Scottish Government's R100 programme, helping to reach the final properties that are not connected, is so vital. And that is particularly true in rural areas. In closing, President Officer, this operation in Stirling has been a fantastic example of multiple organisations working hard together to deliver something that will truly transform the lives of people. I commend the work of City Fibre, Stirling Council, Fourth Housing Association and countless others who have been involved. And I look further forward to the rollout of Ultrafast in Stirling in the coming weeks. President Officer, we are on the verge of delivering the world-class infrastructure needed for the fourth industrial revolution. We now need to ensure that Scotland is able to exploit it to the full for both economic and society's gain. President Officer. Thank you very much, Mr Crawford. I call Maureen Watt, who will be followed by Finlay Carson. Ms Watt. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and <clears throat> I'm very pleased to be speaking in Bruce Crawford's members' debate this evening. I know Mr Crawford sees this installation of full fibre broadband as a bit of a race between Aberdeen and Stirling to be the first to be fully finished with fibre broadband, but I hope I might prove him otherwise. Uh, this motion for to be, to debate tonight is not dissimilar to uh, motion S5M15736, which I lodged on the 5th of February this year, but not for debate. I probably should have. Aberdeen is the first city in Scotland to receive next generation full fibre broadband as part of City Fibre's national uh, fibre to the premises rollout uh, in exclusive partnership with Vodafone in Aberdeen. There is no doubt that the rapid growth of data consumption is, is putting increasing pressure on the copper infrastructure. So thankfully, Aberdeen will join the ranks of some of the best digitally connected cities in the world. It's interesting to note that Aberdeen was chosen as, one as, as the first Scottish city for FTTP because of its strong se tech sector. Aberdeen's full fibre journey began in March 2015, I think in Stirling it was in January 2017, when City Fibre launched proposals for its fibre network, um, 80 kilometres initially to serve the local business community, <coughs> and businesses began to be connected from June 2015. This was extended in June 2017 to 100 kilometres, as Aberdeen City Council began to connect their public sector estate, including schools, libraries, community centres and their offices. By de December 2017, the network had been extended to 100 kilometres. By February 2018, City Fibre had announced its partnership with Vodafone, extending the network to reach nearly every home and business and this was started in July 2018. 
I think it was in November of that year that rollout commenced in Stirling. This spring, <laughs> the first homes go live with gigafast broadband. Since July, City Fibre has on average constructed a thousand newly constructed fibre connections to a thousand homes per month. In my constituency of Aberdeen South and North Concordon, homes are live and receiving the service in Concorth and Torrey, and also connected in the north of the city are Cummings Park and Rose Hill. In total, they have passed around 20,000 homes. This will mean that these homes will receive speeds of 900 megabits per second, which will transform the way customers can access and enjoy seamless connectivity when members of the family are streaming, downloading, downloading and playing all at once. Hopefully it will stop some arguments in some households. It will make remote working much more of a reality. Uh, because there will be instant and reliable access to the cloud. And I think that's really important for business. In my meetings with City Fibre, I've pressed them to recognise that the boundaries of the City of Aberdeen go quite far out and include quite large rural areas. And I've urged them to go out as far as possible. But I think, regrettably, there will be areas that, areas that will not be covered and they will have to uh, come under the R100 programme. I've been out to see their work in a snowy day on Leggart Terrace in my constituency and just last Friday uh, I went into work in my office and they were just outside my office. And I have to say, I've been impressed by the speed and tidiness of their work and the reinstatement of the pavements after they've dug trenches. We'll wait and see if they will withstand frost, ice and snow. City Fibre have also been very attentive in answering my constituents' queries, although there's only been one complaint and they've been dealt with very quickly. So, presiding officer, I look forward to seeing uh, uh, Scotland move up the league tables of being uh, digitally connected countries. Oh, and Stirling probably will be first, only because it's smaller. <laughs> There's a wee feud, a friendly feud going on. I call Finlay Carson to be followed by Lewis MacDonald. Mr Carson, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak in this evening's debate and thank Bruce Crawford for bringing it to the Chamber. I start by declaring interest as a director in CMS Broadband, a firm based in my constituency. As the Scottish Conservative spokesman in the digital economy, as well as a member representing a very rural constituency, it's fair to say that the issue of fibre broadband rollout is one of my top priorities. Bruce Crawford's motion mentions investment from City Fibre, and I had a very positive meeting with the company last year here in Parliament. Their document, Building Scotland's Full Fibre Future, lays out an exciting vision for Scotland's digital future. It cannot be denied that digital is at the heart of everything that we do in our daily lives now. And we must ensure that Scotland is at the very heart of that fourth industrial revolution, like we have been at the forefront of other revolutions. I was at an event just last week in Parliament hosted by Haas Technology Group, part of which looked at how data will play a significant role going forward in facilitating healthy ageing. In Dumfries and Galloway, Lord Byrne Housing Association are already achieving results with advanced risk modelling for early detection, or ARMED as it's commonly known. This helps residents adopt technology to help predict the risk of falls and enable faster support. Now, over a six-month period, there's been a 25 to 1 safe-to-spend ratio with those having the ARM technology having zero falls. So here we have a perfect example of how technology is working to the benefit of people living in our communities. And we're racing into the fourth industrial revolution, a digital revolution which has, unlike the others, the potential to help regenerate the natural environment and potentially undo the damage of previous industrial revolutions. However, as well as having the potential to bridge, it, bridge the gap between those who have and those who have not, particularly in rural areas, if it's not rolled out quickly and universally, it has the potential to widen that gap indefinitely. City Fibre states that deploying gigabit cap cap capability uh, and reliable digital connectivity across a community to consumers, business, the public sector and mobile consumers will transform and future-proof the local economy. With potential benefits of over 2 billion each 
in productivity, innovation and new businesses, the boost to our digital infrastructure must continue apace. And it's pleasing to see work underway in Stirling, continuing the work to expand infrastructure into consumer premises rather than just businesses and public sector contracts. BT rightly points out that due to Scotland's geography and population density, mobile infrastructure continues to be a problem, particularly in rural areas. 4G is not a reality for many of my constituents, already given advantage to more urban areas. Indeed, in some parts, there are little or no mobile signal at all. However, the reality for our cities is that we must develop 5G technology as quickly as possible, with plans to introduce uh, it into Edinburgh and Glasgow uh, via EE this year. This can allow businesses to deliver goods and services in ways they cannot do at the moment. But I always argue that the place to do this is in the most remote and rural areas because that's where the greatest savings and the greatest impacts will be. I could give you an analogy of the way that Dumfries and Galloway Council rolled out their LED light project. Now LEDs, as we know, are cheaper to run and last longer. So when the council decided to roll it out uh, to uh, the, this new low light polluting lighting uh, units, they installed them the furthest away from the, the depot to begin with. So there was immediate savings in terms of servicing those lights and the spend to save policy had an immediate effect on the budget of the lighting department. Now I argue that that would be the same with providing 5G networks with smart home care technology, like already mentioned, uh, causing fewer call outs from health and social care professionals and fewer call outs to remote rural areas from the ambulance service. So it's a no brainer. The Regenesis Consulting Report states that full fibre can unlock 28 billion pounds worth of 5G technology developments. To put that into context, that's double the health budget for this coming financial year. Tonight's uh, debate, I'm sure, will be largely positive, which is not always the case when it comes to digital infrastructure debates in this chamber. And while I commend companies like City Fibre, they must be fully supported by the Scottish Government. And uh, I would like to take the opportunity to ask the Minister, when are we going to get R100? Because I'm absolutely behind it, and it will be trans transformational for rural areas. But when is it likely to be up and running? Now, certainly no, he can't. Too late. <laughs> he's, he's got seconds left. <laughs> the debate like this will become commonplace as the digital revolution shapes our economy in the future. So let's hope we seize the opportunities available to us. Thank you very much. Uh, I call Lewis MacDonald to be followed by Claire Adamson. Thank you very much. And I too congratulate Bruce Crawford on securing this debate and for highlighting the importance of a number of Scotland's cities and city regions in leading the digital revolution. If data is the feedstock of the new economy, then digital infrastructure to send and receive vast quantities of data at the highest possible speeds is as important in the online world as transport infrastructure is to the movement of people and goods. The Aberdeen city region has been one of the first to grasp the opportunity and challenge of ultra-fast connectivity. And as Maureen Watt said, Aberdeen is indeed leading the way in extending uh, next generation full fibre broadband to the premises, FTTP, which is being delivered by a partnership of City Fibre and Vodafone with an investment of £40 million. City Fibre themselves say that Aberdeen was chosen as the first Scottish city in this FTTP rollout, not just because of the community strong tech sector, which has been mentioned, but also because of the Council's forward looking commitment to Smart Cities Initiative. Uh, initiatives and the strength of its support for this project. Those three elements will be important for other cities and regions too. All those three elements, engagement by business, a forward-looking local council and strong buy-in to investment from both public and private sectors. IT in Aberdeen has grown strongly in recent years, first as a byproduct of the energy industry, then as an alternative to it during the downturn of the last five years. Data analysts, and other skilled workers laid off by the oil and gas industry soon found other industries keen to take them on, or in many cases, they set up in business for themselves. Aberdeen City Council and its partners were quick to recognize the urgent need to diversify the local and regional economies and to embrace digital infrastructure as one of the smartest ways of doing that. So Gigabit City Aberdeen was launched as early as 2015, aiming to create an 80 kilometre full fibre network serving new and existing businesses. The Aberdeen City Region deal followed in 2016, bringing the Scottish and UK governments on board 
and establishing Opportunity Northeast to, to represent the private sector in working with Aberdeen City and Aberdeenshire Councils. Aberdeen City Council then extended plans for the network to 100 kilometres by connecting public buildings across the city from 2017 with Scottish Government support. That strategic public investment helped to anchor the deployment of fibre in the city, giving some certainty to private investors who later came forward. And it was, it was also a powerful signal of the city's and the council's support for going further. That takes us to last year's announcement. The aim is to deliver full fibre to the premises to thousands more homes and businesses through an expanded city-wide network of up to 880 kilometres. Construction began last summer, as we've heard, and already the first homes have been connected across the city. And of course, that means full fibre, not just from the exchange to the street cabinet, but also from the street cabinet to every individual home or business that it serves. That will deliver ultra-fast speeds, virtually unlimited bandwidth, and a high standard of reliability too. Some technological advances in recent decades have become obsolete within a few short years. While nobody can know what has not yet been invented, gigabit connectivity is likely to put Aberdeen and our other gigabit cities in a very strong place for decades to come. So good news for existing businesses, making for great places to start up new business, and lots of other opportunities as well for on online GP consultations, which Bruce Crawford mentioned, and remote mon monitoring of vulnerable people living alone to online learning opportunities at school, college, and university. And a solid foundation for Aberdeen's next century post-oil economy, delivering the world-class and worldwide connectivity essential for the city and region to diversify and grow. Thank you very much. I call Claire Adamson to follow by Gordon Lindhurst. Mr Lindhurst is the last speaker in the open debate. Ms Adamson. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I want to start by thanking Bruce Crawford for bringing this debate to the Chamber. Um, we've talked about broadband and connectivity issues many times, and it's been interesting to hear some of the perspectives from around the country today. Of course, for those of us lucky enough to have good broadband connectivity, it's something that we can too much take for granted. But even in my area, in Motherwell Militia, which is a, bit, a very urban area, um, I'm constantly frustrated that we are still building new housing estates without the, the, the very best connectivity applied to them. And, and I have um, indeed new estates in my area that don't have um, a, a speed that um, is satisfactory to the people who live and work in, in those areas. Um, um, Literally, our homes are littered with devices. In my case, definitely littered. We have phones, tablets, note notepads, PCs, smart TVs. Um, I've resisted the Alexa because I am the fount of all knowledge in my house. Um, but <laughs> there's absolutely no doubt that these things are increasing in our lives. And um, as we get more smart technology in um, the appliances that we have in our house, in actual environments of our house, then um, the, the requirement for good broadband and good um, connectivity is there. Um, the Internet of Things is upon us, and as we have more sensors using the Wi-Fi LoRa network throughout Scotland that's been rolled out by the Scottish Government, there'll be more opportunity for us to actually have sensors in our environments that will monitor behaviour and change behaviours um, in the, in the interest of cities that have um, smart connectivity, that you could be seeing um, traffic and not air pollution being regulated by diverting traffic to areas uh, or letting people know where their car, car parking space is, which would help me greatly when I'm visiting the cities um, in our country. Uh, and also um, restaurant bookings, all these kind of things that can be um, monitored and, and, and given to people directly on, on their own mobile devices. So it's certainly something we should be embracing uh, and, and we should be making the investment that we need in broadband networks. And it's essential for Scottish economy to keep pace with an increasingly globalised and interconnected world. And um, if I pay tribute to the SCDI publication done in conjunction with um, the Scottish Government and BT, Automatic for the People, it actually showed that practically every area of our lives are going to be affected by new technologies, by AI, by robotics. And that in order to take the best advantages for all the reasons that were discussed by both Finlay Carson and Lewis McDonald's in terms of looking after people in their own homes, and supporting people who want to stay in their own homes that in order to have the, the best advantages we need to be investing in this area 
but it doesn't paint the full picture. Um, only 6% of UK properties have access to full fibre broadband. And I know Mr Crawford called it the gold standard. And it's not a phrase he coined, I don't think, that gold standard have been using, used very often to describe this. I find that a bit strange, because I, I thought the whole point was getting the metal out of the system and it being full fibre. But <laughs> there we have it. So um, it seems a strange way to describe it. It seems to be the the parlance that's used in this area is to achieve that um, gold fibre, because we know that many homes, although they have um, fibre optics available to them, they still have the copper cables that do not hold the same capacity as fibre optic cables. And that's what this project and the work that's been done across some of our cities is, is doing and is so important. And just finally to say, um, there's been many me mentions of the rural areas in, in our constitu constituencies, but I do think it's important to to mention Inverness, Fort William and Thurso and Wick, where some of this work has been rolled out in um, some of the public sector sites that they have there. And um, of course, we all want to work to that, that standard in, throughout Scotland so that all of our communities can benefit from this investment. So thank you. Thank you. And before I call Gordon Lundhurst, can I say it's a little more relaxed in members' debate. So if a member presses a button to request to speak, um, one has the opportunity to take them. So you won't be the last speaker, Mr Lindhurst. You'll be followed by Tom Arthur. Mr Lindhurst. <clears throat> Deputy Presiding Officer, may I join in the consensus of thanks to Bruce Crawford for bringing this debate to the Chamber today. Because as a Lothian MSP, it is something particularly important to the City of Edinburgh, for example, which is uh, part of the Lothian region I represent. And Edinburgh is, of course, part of the Scottish Gigabit City program. Now, as an ambitious digital city, this investment will help Edinburgh uh, and ensure that we join some of the most digitally connected cities across the world. It is estimated that a similar 600 million investment in 1994 brought a 1.8 billion return to the city of Stockholm, where successful startups Spotify and Skype originated. Edinburgh also has a, a proud track record in this area, home to digital startups such as Skyscanner, which have developed into world leading companies. That Edinburgh and the surrounding region already has solid foundations in the data sector is evidenced by the exciting future that we certainly hope the city has ahead of it. The UK and Scottish government funding towards the £1.3 billion Edinburgh and South East Scotland city region deal aims to establish the region as the data capital of Europe. This brings together key partners in the city. Certainly. Willie Coffey. Thank you very much for taking the intervention. Could you tell us if you support Scotland being taken out of the digital single market, given the importance we're hearing of the whole digital agenda to the Scottish economy? Still interest. I think the beauty of the digital world is that we're all part of it, whatever the politicians decide about other things. Turning to what I've talked about in previous debates, um, Edinburgh is pioneering work in areas such as agritech to transform agri-food systems across the world and achieve food and environmental security. Fast and reliable internet access is therefore vital for a city and region with the ambitions that Edinburgh and the Southeast region have to be a leader in data. Edinburgh's existing fiber network had already connected businesses in the public sector estate to gigabit speed internet, but the extension of that will mean that it reaches almost every home and business in the city. Giving households the access to the latest technology in which to thrive is essential for the future of Edinburgh not just in allowing people to access the latest entertainment using the most up-to-date technology, including buffer-free video calling and real-time gaming, but also in giving the people and businesses of Edinburgh the tools to allow them to work and be competitive, including through increased productivity, which could be worth an estimated 86 million pounds to Edinburgh businesses over the next 15 years. And by ensuring homes in Edinburgh will soon benefit from the same speed of access as the public sector estate, Edinburgh's children can make use of the latest innovative e-learning techniques, both during and outside of school hours, helping to create the next digitally literate generation. 
and maintain Edinburgh's reputation as a globally competitive digital city. Deputy Presiding Officer, full fiber and 5G is at the heart of the UK's industrial and digital strategies as we embark on the fourth industrial revolution which will fundamentally change the way we live and work. This investment from city fiber to deliver fiber to the home broadband puts Edinburgh at the forefront of that and I'm happy to welcome it. It may indeed help us to discover some of the, some of the unknown uninventeds which Lewis MacDonald referred to. Thank you, I call Tom Arthur. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'm, I'm very grateful for you giving me the opportunity to contribute very briefly to this debate. Now, I would like to begin by thanking my colleague, uh, Bruce Crawford, for securing this debate. Um, I think it's very timely. Uh, and I, I noticed that Bruce Crawford's initials, if you think BC, I think before connectivity, because I'm at that particular generation where I was born at around the time of the advent of the personal computer. I was about 10 or 11 years old when my father brought home our first modem. I was about 18 years old when we uh, got broadband in the house for the first time. And I was about 21 years old when Facebook and MySpace and other social media platforms started to emerge. So I feel I'm straddling this digital div uh, divide to some extent. Uh, I have clear memories of VHS and record and having to program video recorders, but I'm equally comfortable and fluent using social media, Facebook, and talking about the internet of things. And it's, I find it very striking in conversations with people who are genuine digital na uh, natives, people born this side of the millennium, and how fundamentally different their worldview is to my own worldview, having been immersed in, in this digital world. Now, the reason I state this as a preamble is because many contributors have made reference to the fourth industrial revolution. It's a, it's a neat term. It's a sort of term that we have actually to somewhat uh, become rather accustomed to. The use of words like revolution. We live in an age of slick marketing companies and PR organizations. And so terms like fourth industrial revolu revolution can become, can sound a bit glib and we perhaps don't take them as serious as we should. But at the heart of this fourth industrial revolution will be connectivity. And the project that City Fibre and Gigabit Cities as an entity is engaged in is something that will facilitate 5G technology. And 5G will really be the bedrock of this fourth industrial revolution. And I genuinely believe it will be a revolution for good, as we have discussed, but also with potential for bad. And by revolution, I mean it in that broader sense, an event as of um, signal importance as the agricultural revolution, the invention of cities, the industrial revolution, the splitting of the atom. Because how we live our lives and how we engage with each other can be changed in such a way it's more, so profound it can be difficult for us to comprehend. If we think about the internet of things where every device that we use, from our phones to pacemakers, to refrigerators, to televisions, to in, uh, uh, devices to monitor our pets, to our vehicles, to our bikes, to our aircraft, all connected, all engaged, and all subject to the power of supercomputers employing techniques of big data to analyze, yes, pretend, potential for tremendous good, but also potential for tremendous abuse. And I think it's incredibly important as politicians, when we discuss um, the fourth industrial revolution and 5G, that while yes, we talk about the benefits and the transformative, absolutely. Finley Carson. You, you talk about the, the potential for there to be bad, but you also recognize how important uh, ensuring it's spread over every community and, and it reaches right into rural communities because the potential of 5G to exclude people is probably greater now than it's ever been with a digital divide potentially uh, a, a causing real division between uh, socially isolated communities and, and, and cities. Tom Arthur. I thank the member for that um, intervention. I agree entirely. I think it can be a geographical divide, but I think there's also the danger of a demographic divide. And it's incredibly important we address that and make sure that the gains, the fruits of the fourth industrial revolution that 5G will power and enable, that they are enjoyed by everyone. And that's clearly when we uh, consider perhaps some of the challenges around how that data will be managed. Now, Willie Co uh, Coffey made reference to the single digital market. I'm not going to make a speech about Brexit, but I think it's very important whatever the UK's future relationship is with the European Union and indeed with other um, trading entities and countries that we think very carefully about how we're going to manage that data. Because I think if we consider the amount of data that we 
um, voluntarily pass on to organisations such as Google or Amazon or Apple for that matter, that amount of data is going to go exponentially in the coming years and decades. And we have to make sure that with that rise, that our regulatory frameworks, our control, our democratisation of that data um, matches and keeps up with that. Because to fail to do so would potentially lead to a situation where, as Finlay Carson highlighted, not everyone can um, enjoy these benefits. It, it, because it's your debate, I'll demur. It's not very often I demur, but I'm demurring. And it, Mr. Arthur, you did say at the beginning it would be brief. Okay. Just, you, you, Tom Arthur quite rightly mentioned the access to the digital goods and services, which the digital strategy within the European Union was all about. But that was also about ensuring better access to consumers, businesses, online goods and services across Europe, but also building in the protections that you were talking about specifically to ensure that people across Europe were protected from the more, the more difficult areas that this might produce and being removed from that might remove some of these um, protections we might enjoy. Mr Arthur. I agree absolutely and I think it's really important and not to be overly partisan but whatever happens going forward with regards to Brexit and the future relationship with the European Union, I think it's important that we talk about these difficult and challenging areas. We've been very much, there's been very many conversations about the backstop and other areas and the various political intrigues, but I think it's important that we in this Parliament and elsewhere give an airing to more of these issues because they are fundamentally important. They're the heart of what the European project is about and regardless of what the future relationship would be, it would be a, a dereliction of duty on our part if we did not give that full scrutiny. Anyway, I've been, I've indulged to some opposite officer, so thank you very much for the opportunity to speak in this debate, and thank you again to Bruce Crawford for um, securing it. I'm just thinking, these aren't 5G speeches, these are very slow speeches. Anyway, I now, at last, because I know there's events waiting to start, uh, I call Paul Wheelhouse, Minister, to sum up for the government, please. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, and, and uh, I want to add my words of thanks to Bruce Crawford for calling this motion today and to colleagues from across the chamber who have contributed to a lively debate and uh, you know sitting through the debate uh, waiting for my opportunity to speak I think um, this, this debate has actually shown the parliament a very good light because I think uh, we've seen some very intelligent speeches from across the chamber about a very important subject which of interest to both rural and urban Scotland of course and indeed uh, the, I thank the presiding officer for letting Tom Arthur speak because I think that was a very worthwhile addition to the debate from Tom and uh, I think what's uh, the debate has highlighted is that there is a, a great opportunity uh, in this debate to discuss something which is perhaps less well covered in a debate about broadband, that of the rollout of commercial uh, provision in our cities. But also, very importantly, I, I agree wholeheartedly with Finlay Carson and others who, who uh, want us to make sure we keep the focus on uh, ensuring there are no uh, new sources of digital divide in rural Scotland as well. And I'll hopefully come on to that later in my speech. But since taking the helm as Minister for Connectivity, I've had many discussions with stakeholders, businesses, and community representatives across Scotland. And it's been made very clear to me there's a unanimous desire to make this country one of Europe's most well-connected. And we have, have a real opportunity, as a number of colleagues have said, to do so in the years ahead of us, making cities like Stirling, Aberdeen, Edinburgh, world-leading digital cities. Uh, and uh, you know, certainly to, to uh, accept that there's a degree of competition between colleagues across the chamber. I hope all of our cities can uh, meet that standard. But as I alluded to earlier, uh, we all too often forget the provision of broadband is first and foremost a commercial matter. And so I really want to applaud City Viber and other commercial providers for choosing to invest Scotland. We're very grateful as a government they do. And in the case of City Fibre, as the motion in Mr Crawford's name suggests, the company is committed to approaching £200 million to its fibre investments in Scotland, which is not insignificant. And governments, regulators and wider uh, public sector have an important part to play in helping to create an environment that attracts investment and I'll touch on that shortly. But it's, uh, it's a commercial investment that will drive world-class digital connectivity and an innovation it enables across all aspects of society and economy, as have been mentioned by Finlay Carson, Claire Adamson, and Tom Arthur uh, latterly. And it's clear that City Fibre's substantial investment in their Gigabit Cities programme in locations such as Stirling and the rapid deployment of their networks has delivered huge benefits for Scotland, driving value and choice for their customers in the private and public sectors and helping cities like Aberdeen to diversify its economy, as Lewis MacDonald and Maureen Watt have alluded to. And back in 2017, I know that the Scottish Government delivered £2 million to support Aberdeen City Council's ambition to increase broadband speeds for key public buildings across the city. 
City Fibre have delivered that connectivity and this helped pave the way for the deal that Vodafone, uh, with Vodafone that will see residents in Aberdeen enjoy gigabit capable broadband. But, presiding officer, I'm, I'm pleased to say that City Fibre is one of a number of companies who've announced substantial commercial investment plans in Scotland in recent months. The likes of Openreach, Virgin Media, Hyperoptic are all investing in fibre, uh, with others poised to enter the Scottish market, and all are playing a key role in delivering uh, of the Scottish Government's digital ambitions. However, clearly not all of Scotland has benefited from that commercial investment, and this is where I agree with Finlay Carson, Claire Adamson and others. Despite the reserved nature of telecoms legislation, uh, the Scottish Government is doing all it can to help make Scotland the best place for telecommunications industry to invest in digital infrastructure. We're taking a number of steps to uh, help incentivise industry. We've introduced rates relief on new fibre infrastructure for 10 years. That's double the commitment uh, made by the UK Government. We've relaxed planning legislation to make it easier for operators to deploy new infrastructure. Uh, we're developing proposals to extend permitted development rights, again to assist new projects, and to pick up Claire Adamson's point, we're amending our building regulations to ensure a set standard for the inbuilding of new physical infrastructure, uh, including digital infrastructure, and I hope that helps the point she identified. But further to this, we've also created a Scottish version of the DCMS uh, Street Works Toolkit, that's the Department of Culture, Media and Sport at UK level, to support operators to navigate the complexities of roadworks across Scottish local authorities and avoid timely and costly deployment delays. And all of this serves to demonstrate the extent to which we're going to make sure Scotland is at the forefront of the digital revolution, despite uh, the reserved areas, as I mentioned. And in that regard, Scotland has already come a long way. No matter what source you use, the evidence categorically demonstrates that Scotland has caught up dramatically with the rest of the UK and continues to do so, thanks in large part to the £400 million Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband Programme that Bruce Crawford mentioned. Without the programme, we know that only 66% of premises across the country were expected to have access to fibre broadband, just 21% across the Highlands, and there were no commercial coverage plans at all for Orkney, Shetland and the Western Isles, uh, a point that's not lost on me as Scot the Scottish Government's Minister for the Islands. Indeed, Ofcom's most recent Connected Nations report confirmed that, once again, Scotland has outperformed the UK as a whole on deployment of new digital infrastructure over the previous 12 months and is closing the digital divide. Taken in total, access to superfast broadband has now increased by over 31 percentage points in Scotland in the last five years, compared to 19 percentage points in the UK as a whole. And I could give a list of examples, but I won't today for time, uh, presiding officer, of, uh, but there's a response to Emma Harper which details the points which show that uh, lo the local authorities have gone from almost zero uh, to over 70 or 80 percent in some cases over that time frame. So figures provided by independent analysis site Think Broadband paint an even more positive picture indicating that more than 93 uh, percent of all homes and businesses in Scotland now have access to super fast broadband infrastructure capable of delivering speeds of 30 megabits per second and above. And of course while this success is to be celebrated we cannot be complacent, and Finlay Carson is right on that, regarding avoiding uh, creating new opportunities for a digital divide to, to emerge. And, and so we certainly I want to reassure members, including Mr Carson, that we're seeking to, with R100, take an outside-in approach to pick up the point he mentioned earlier on about the, the benefits, the cost benefits of tackling outer areas first and working our way in. Uh, telecoms is at the heart of everything we do, of course, whether for work or pleasure, we've come to expect we will be able to access fast and reliable digital connectivity wherever we need it, whenever we need it. And while we're demonstrably clo closing the gap, there's still too many people across the country who cannot yet reap the benefits that access to fast, reliable broadband can provide. But sadly, there are still um, are some households who would describe their broadband speed as being steam-driven, to, be to pick up uh, uh, Mr Crawford's point. But thankfully, that number is diminishing as we speak and hopefully will eventually be eliminated. But these benefits that we discuss are, are, are substantial. In 2014, Scotland's digital economy was estimated to be worth around £4.5 billion. Pounds. Uh, even at that point, with the potential to go far further, and we've heard some great examples from Gordon Lindhurst and others about the kind of areas where you can see growth and uh, multiplier effect kicking in from investment in broadband. And a recent independent report has further highlighted the increasing importance of good quality digital connectivity by stating that every pound of public investment in fibre broadband infrastructure in Scotland is delivering nearly £12 in benefits to the Scotland's economy. Not an insubstantial return on investment by anyone's measure, and indeed the commercial investment of City Fibre and others will also be having similar impacts on our economy. So it's vital this momentum is not lost, and that's why we've chosen to take the lead and invest our own resources to deliver the infrastructure that Scotland needs to help our country prosper, despite responsibility for broadband uh, resting with the UK government. 
And our £600 million reaching 100% programme, uh, which I recognise Mr Carson is asking about timing, so I should just, if, if please your forbearance, presiding officer, give some indication of where we are on that. Um, certainly, uh, we would argue that um, no other part of the UK has uh, made a commitment with the scale and ambition that we have. And from the outset, we sought to try and ensure that we have competitive bidding process to ensure the best value for money uh, for the £600 million investment. The process is a complex one. We've had to build in a degree of flexibility in response to changes in the intervention area, the number of properties that we have to cover, uh, and we will award contracts later in 2019. And I, I certainly will give Mr Carson and colleagues across the chamber as much notice of the timing of that as I can uh, when we get nearer to it. But I recognise a strong interest across the chamber. Procurement for R100 does continue to progress apace, and we have retained three really high, highly credi credible bidders in the process, which I hope is of, uh, of value to members across the chamber. This level of competition will help to ensure the best possible solutions and outcomes for Scotland, and I look forward to sharing further progress uh, in due course. But what I can say at this point is that we're confident R100 procurement is going to produce a fantastic outcome, one that we hope will make rural Scotland one of the most digitally connected places anywhere in Europe. And, and to pick up the points I made earlier on, just imagine what a difference that can make in tackling depopulation, economic growth in our rural communities, and making a real difference. So the Future Proof Network we'll expect R100 to deliver across the country will enable all of Scotland to be part of that digital revolution that members have talked so eloquently of today and to share in the economic benefits. Full fibre and 5G, to pick up points made by, by Mr Carson, uh, Mr Lindhurst and others, uh, will uh, certainly enable the movement of data, ideas and applications in the same way that canals and railways uh, perhaps underpinned the previous industrial revolution. And our investment alongside that of commercial partners and players like City Fibre will ensure Scotland is well equipped to compete. So uh, I, I'm conscious of time, presiding officer, so I should wrap up. But we have created, uh, we believe we've created a distinct offer for, for the industry in Scotland with some of the measures I outlined earlier. City Fibre are one of many companies who are responding positively to that, and we welcome that. Uh, that investment is uh, helping to strengthen our position as hopefully one of Europe's most well-connected nations. And I trust and believe from what I've heard tonight, we have the support of the Chamber in delivering that ambition. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. That concludes the debate. I close this meeting.